Welcome to another edition of What's Going On with Shipping. I am joined once again by popular request, I might add, because of the amount of viewership he has uh, by Bill Doyle. Uh, Bill is absolutely the best person I can bring on here. Uh, former executive director of the Port of Baltimore, CEO of Dredging Contractors of America. Bill is working uh, on this process right now in and around the Port of Baltimore with the removal of the dolly, with the dredging and the opening of the port. So I thought we'd have Bill back on and give us an update. Bill, good to see you again, sir. Thank you very much, Sal. Uh, glad to be back on. Things are moving. Uh, but before you start, I really want to say thank you. And this is coming from the, the American uh, U.S. maritime industry. Thank you for um, taking an interest in this. Um, this has been a dominant American private sector operation. And you have really pointed that out. And from the American Maritime Partnership and all the folks in the U.S. flag industry, all the academies in the United States, maritime academies, uh, thank you. Well, I, I appreciate that. You know, one of the things I hop on a lot here is we need a lot of infrastructure improvements in the United States. And you can't always count on bringing in assets from around the world. We need stuff here at times. And, and there's no better way to have those assets here than they're working in the United States. They're they're working in the ports all up and down the coast. And, you know, I'm just I'm amazed because I just saw an image the other day and the forest of mass of cranes that are off the, the port of Baltimore right now is absolutely incredible. And when, you know, we'll cut in here some images that everybody can see of the amount of work that's being done and the amount of tonnage that's being moved is, is really incredible. I know everybody wants to see big, huge, massive cranes being brought in, but what you're seeing here is is just a, uh, you know, a, a, an ant army of, of work being done on this. So Bill, I thought we'd go through a couple of things real quick. Number one, I thought we'd uh, get an update. Where do you see where we're at right now uh, in the situation? This is being filmed on April 17th. So where do you see us at right now? All right, we're in good shape. So you did see what the Unified Command put out. The Army Corps of Engineers has really put out some great graphics on um, where the channel is going to be, the 50-foot channel, and where the temporary access channel is going to be. Okay, So we are on schedule to open the temporary access channel, which will be 35 feet deep, 280 feet wide, that will allow one-way traffic in and out of the Port of Baltimore. Now, what's being modeled right now is once that is open, how are you gonna do the transits? So what is, what is being modeled is transits in the evening, in the nighttime, in the dock, back and forth, uh, through the Port of Baltimore, through that channel, temporary access channel. And then during the daytime, you have all of the salvage operations and wreckage and debris removal go on in daylight hours. So it makes sense. So you'll have tug assist through the temporary access channel, if this is the, the ultimately determined to be the way to, to, way to move forward. But we still want to get the 50-foot channel, 700 feet wide channel, open by the end of May. And we're on schedule right now. Yeah, you know, it, it's a really daunting task, but I think it is a doable. I did a video where we looked at what the Army Corps uh, engineers put out for that graphic. And looking at that, I, I mean, you move ships in and out of Baltimore on slack tides anyway, so you'd have to time it on the slack tide in the evening, but you're not going to be working too much in the evening anyway. So you can definitely start seeing that movement. Once you get the main, you know, above water elements there, the trusses out of the way, and then remove that uh, area below water, you can start moving traffic. Uh, There's going to be a big challenge for the pilots, obviously. I know the pilots are undergoing training right now, and they're going through simulators to get ready for that. There will have to be tug escorts to get them in and out. But I do think you're, you're in a prospect. I think the big variable here is going to be the weather. I mean, that's always seems to be. Last week, I know some weather came in. It's a tough one sometimes in the Bay to be working, and, and we're getting ready to roll into hurricane season here. So, I, I mean, there's obviously – issues associated with that. So I, I do think that what we're seeing here is is some good progress on it. Uh, has anything unusual or, or any issues come up? I, I know that the the, the, the Dally, for example, is creating some problems with it. It's, it's a big problem to move it. I thought it was really interesting that they came out and said, okay, the priority is not going to be moving the ship. It's going to be opening the channel first while we work on moving the ship. And um, that's absolutely correct, Sal. So so the ship, once they determined the ship was largely out of the channel, okay? So it's, it's you know, 80% of the channel is free from the ship. So let's get the temporary access channel open first. And then dealing with that truss that is hanging over the bow, 
And then also, if you pointed out, the bulbous bow itself is wedged in the mud under the bridge. And you have the weight of the containers and the weight of the truss. So that's being handled right now. As a matter of fact, um, I spoke with one of the uh, surveyors last night. So they're the surveyors that do the underwater sauna. They're turning their attention now to, um, okay, how far is that bulbous bow in the mud? Because it pushed in and made a hill. So you have a hill that collapse, may have collapsed into the channel. They're going to get the survey and saunas on that and see, you know, see what the next steps are. There's a lot of walking and chewing gum going on at the same time. There are multiple different operations being visualized. You know what's going to happen next as we work on that temporary access channel and the, uh, um, you know, the full 50 foot, 700 uh, feet wide channel. Yeah. And again, this is something we saw two years ago with error forward when it went into the mud, you know, the dynamics of what happens when a ship goes aground. It, it, it's not as simple as a lot of people think there there's there's mud displacement, there's ground displacement, you've got suction issues. And then, you know, the added issue here is four to five thousand tons pushing down on that bow which I think is actually pushing it in the mud a little bit more. I've noticed that on the on the line, you know, some someone had an issue where they said the ship's sinking. It's not. I think it's just the, the weight is kind of really compressing it in there a bit because it's, it's a lot of force on it. I, ha I will say that the movement of containers off has been really remarkable. I think they're doing a great job. Unfortunately, they had practice with this two years ago, but they are moving, especially damaged containers. I, I, I don't think people really understand that it's one thing to move an undamaged container, but when you have damaged containers, and a lot of these are really severely damaged, you got to be really careful. Fortunately, up on the bow, you have a lot of smaller containers, lighter containers, mm -hmm. empty, but you also have the hazmat material containers up there too. So there's a lot of challenges that these crews are are, are facing uh, when it comes to this. So the other element we have here coming in, obviously, is 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 a lot. I did a whole video on on payments and 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 the insurance issue. Uh, the owner of the vessel just recently declared general average, which creates a new dynamic here when it comes to the salvage of the vessel. And, you know, this is something that you know extremely well, because in, in your many long, varied career here was working with the Federal Maritime Commission as a commissioner and knowing this 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 background. I was wondering if you want to comment a little bit about that aspect, because, you know, everyone's talking about who's going to pay for this, that the government has come out and said they're going to pay. But now cargo is being told they're going to pay for it. So maybe you can clarify that a little bit for the audience. And so there's, there's actually two things, Sal. Um, you get general maritime law, which is limited liability. That was the first action that you saw the ship owners and operators walk into court and do limit the liability. So limiting the liability under maritime law is um, what's left, value of the vessel minus repairs. So I think what you saw filed in court, and this is, this is old uh, maritime general law. Um, you know, they value the vessel at $90 million, $28 million in repair costs, $20 million in uh, salvage costs, and $1.1 million in cargo. You subtract that from the 90. So that's what they walked into court first and, and filed. That happens every time there is a maritime incident of, of this nature. What you've also heard is general average. In general average, that's not law. That's a contractual item. And that's a contract item that the shippers, those are your cargo owners, beneficial cargo owners, for instance, your retailers, what they do is they agree that if there's a major maritime incident on board the ship, the damages and pay for that, those damages will be spread throughout the companies that place their cargo on the ship. So, you know, when you look at the um, general average being declared, one of them has to do with going aground. Always uh, has to do with going aground. And that takes care of, um, you know, the, the, the risk and the liability is spread throughout basically the container owners who have their cargo in the containers, salvage expenses incurred by the salvage, the cost of repairing any damage to port facilities caused by the casualties, cost of providing temporary alternative accommodation to passengers and crew, and we know the passengers and crew are on board the ship right now. Uh, costs involved in evacuating passengers, it's not passengers on this ship, and the hiring of tugboats to move the vessel uh, out of the area um, in, into the port. So those are the type of costs. Now, how is that calculated? 
or there are experts in the industry, adjusters will come in and they will evaluate what cargo is on board the ship and what percentage each cargo owner would be responsible for. So that's basically what the general averages sell. Yeah, I, I mean, you're exactly right. And so I'm glad you mentioned the general uh, general liability issues or limited liability issues, because that is such a big thing. I mean, this goes back to 1851, when the idea is if your ship is sunk and it doesn't arrive, you can't be sued for anything because there's no value left. It is very different than the land. I tell people this all the time. When, when you cannot compare to what happens on land to what happens on sea because of the long tradition of shipping and what it involves and the general average is another great claim you know i always use the, the the analogy that you're you know you're driving in an uber you're in the backseat of an uber gets in a car crash well you're not responsible at all for it in the maritime world you can be because you you know that uber wouldn't be driving unless you were in the back and now all of a sudden you have to share in some of the costs that's there it's one of the reasons i tell people whoever ship cargo is make sure you're using you know either a freight forwarder or you're cognizant enough to get your general average insurance because everyone right now is scrambling to see whether or not they have that insurance to cover them or else they could be on the hook for this. Uh, and and this is the thing we see. I mean, I mean, again, and they're still working on general average claims from ever, uh, ever given in the Suez. So this is going to be a long drawn out affair. I mean, it, it takes a long time to figure out what the overall costs are going to be associated with this. And I think that's something we're going to be watching for a long time to come. So, Bill, obviously, the other issue we see going on right now is a lot of discussion. We just had the FBI announce going on board the vessel as part of an investigation because of the deaths. Uh, we just seen the recovery of the fourth of the six uh, people who are lost on the bridge. And I, I think we should mention something here real quick, that while we may not be talking about the recovery operations for those who are lost, the two remaining people, that's an ongoing issue that is going on as the salvage goes on. It may not be talked about enough, but every time they're removing debris and, and scanning, they are looking for those remains. And I think that's, that's a really important one for us to, to clarify, because some people think that, that that they have been forgotten and they're not. But on the issue here of the accident, so now we got the FBI involved, you got the NTSB on board, Coast Guard, you're going to have the flag state involved, you'll have the insurance company involved, there's a lot of investigators that will be involved here and everything. But one of the issues that keeps coming up is, is the issue of fuel, and, and you and I both have had the conversations about this, and I was wondering if you want to talk about that for a little bit, because again, we don't know what the underlying cause for the power issue is, whether it was fuel, mechanical, electrical, but one of the things we do know is that there's a fuel issue in the industry, right? Right now yes uh and you know i want to echo what you said about the the victims okay the lost the folks that are lost um an, another body was recovered this um uh, this past monday so of the six two are remaining um that we're looking for and divers are down when the salvage operations are going on when the debris and records removal is going on we are looking for we are looking for the victims uh that remain so that families can have um, get their loved ones back. Okay. So thanks for bringing that up. Okay. On the fuel, there is a worldwide problem of contamination in marine fuel called bunkers. So for your listeners, um, bunkers are what we call marine fuel on ships. And bunkering ports exist in the world, the largest one being in Singapore. And I know you'll be able to show a video of the amount of ships or a pictorial of the amount of ships uh, that are in Singapore, but Singapore has about nearly 25% of all ships that are fueled, all the bunker, all of the fuel for ships comes out of Singapore. And then they're in, they're located in areas that you would obviously think would mean it, like Gibraltar, okay, as you're going through the Mediterranean, you go to Gibraltar, you get uh, marine fuel, that's a bunker port. Rotterdam, one of the largest ports in Europe, that's a bunker port. But what we're seeing in, in, in the bunkering industry is you have contaminants that enter the fuel. And like you said, Sal, we don't know what happened yet in uh, the Dali, what happened in Baltimore, if it is a fuel issue. But no question, there is a fuel problem because contaminants enter into the fuel. And it can be vegetable oil. It can be uh, viscous oils. It can be polymers, it can be plastics. And all of those uh, impurities that get into fuel end up clogging the injectors of a diesel engine or an auxiliary engine. And just as a point of reference, 
there were, and I wrote it down, there were over um, 600 disabled vessels in 2022 around the world due to contaminated fuel. That's no small number. And that's, that's, that was put out by Fuel Trust Research out of Houston. So we do see 600 vessels losing power on the seas in 2022. This is something that I think that all governments around the world, including the United States, may be leading the charge. And we need to get a handle on the impurities and the contaminants in fuel so that we can have safe transits in and out of the United States and around the world. Yeah, I, you know, I got to say again, even though shit, uh, fuel is being tested and it meets the minimum standards, I, I think we got to look at our minimum standards in some cases because we're not even testing for some of the contaminants that are getting in the fuel. And, and remember, we're, the engines are getting much more sensitive, especially as we've seen the shift over to low sulfur fuel oils as we're trying to limit pollutions by both sulfur and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and and as you said before there are a lot of things that you know you can run contaminated fuel the problem is does it cause you clogging the injectors your strainers all these elements start playing in and, and again even we're not saying the fuel was the ultimate cause because we don't know what the ultimate cause has caused uh dally to lose its, its power but we know it's an issue and it's an ongoing issue and again it, it's not, you know one of the things i've been hopping on is vdrs on ships they need to be better than what they are right now that VDR doesn't catch anywhere near the amount of data that an, uh, an airplane's black box does, for example, uh, so that we can go back in and take a look at it. Uh, even just the recording on the bridge, because you have a 150 foot long bridge where people are running and screaming and, you know, down the length, you, you don't even catch the audio very well compared to a cockpit where two pilots are sitting side by side, for example. And, and, and you bring up a good point because, you know, since fuel was first on ships, there's always been fraud. You know, involved with with you know how you, you can put water in the fuel, okay, to you know get a get a better price. So that's fraud. But the point that you brought up is even fuel that's considered on spec, that's what they call it, on spec. The impurities in there with the engines and auxiliary engines today, uh, even if it meets that criteria, there are still contaminants in the fuel that can shut down an engine. And we may have to, you know, reevaluate that. I mean, the world's gas station, like I said, is for ships is Singapore, right? And then you have a whole slew around the world uh, on those ships. But the the sensitivity uh, of these engines, these new uh, engines that are com that, that come out that are you know environmentally safe, they are ultimately sensitive. And if you get plastics and rubbers and and junk uh, in the fuel. They can do some damage. And like I said, 600 vessels in 2022 is no small amount. No. And, and you know, and we're sailing ships longer distances because of the diversions around the Red Sea. And, you know, where the traditional bunker ports, Fujairah, for example, it's a huge one. That maybe a lot of ships not going there now because they're not going to that region anymore. So they've got to get fuel in different areas. And, yeah. you know, I've had conversations with people, executives and businesses in shipping firms with chief engineers like, oh, we will never fuel at this place because we know that the fuel is going to give us problems or we'll keep it segregated and we're not going to try to use it. We'll have to mix it to make it even better. And, and again, it shouldn't be a problem. Most of us who pull up to a gas station don't worry about the fuel we put into our vehicle vehicle, yet ships worry about this all the time. It, it is a huge concern for the shipping industry. Bill, I, I thought we'd wrap up on talking about what we see going forward, where we're at, uh, what are the big next steps that you see? And I also want to take a moment, if you could, talk about the dredgers out there, because you know one of the things that I'm watching right now are the clamshell dredgers just hauling up gear after gear you know what you know the the easiest thing to cut for us is is those big trusses they're nice they're big you make your cuts and it's not easy by any means i'm not i'm not, not making i'm not not you know making it sound too easy but but that's a very visible thing but at the same time you know you watch everything from excavators on barges to the clamshells coming in to start pulling up what is the meat of this bridge which is the roadway sections so you know what's coming up next and if you could talk a little bit about the dredgers that'd be great so um I'll put a plug in for the Unified Command, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Navy, uh, and the state of Maryland. They're doing a great job. They are command and control. So they're the command and control, making sure that the private sector uh, is doing the work. So, you know, when we talk dredges, um, you know, dredge is dredge. Okay, so they dredge channels and they um, do beach nourishment. But the, the same equipment turns into 
wreckage removal and debris removal. It's the same equipment. So you're talking about the deck, um, the asphalt, the concrete that's on the bridge, that's in the water, that fell down in large uh, pieces. We have equipment. Equipment is being used that will punch that deck while it's in the water, break it into smaller pieces. And then the clamshells, the dredges, come behind and will remove that material. And then it all gets transferred to uh, Trade Point Atlantic. There's a huge piece of, uh, and this will be interesting to see, I believe it comes up on the 20th. It's on its way up from the Gulf right now, Sal. Uh, and it's used in offshore uh, oil rigs uh, decommissioning. So it's a huge um, 1,000 metric ton grabber, hydraulic grabber. So that'll be placed on one of the cranes and that will be used to uh, remove more debris. But the plan has not changed uh, from Unified Command. Temporary access channel, full um, channel opening, simultaneously removing the dolly at some point, you know, because you, you may not open the entire 700 foot channel, even if 20% is blocked by the ship. So that, those will be safety calling audibles as we go. Um, Unified Command will on what's the safest point to move that ship up. It is safety first. The temporary access channel is going to be a big deal uh, when that opens up. I would also say that, you know, Sal, the way that you would put it out is, you know, what is the economy? Where are the economics? Look, the longshoremen are out of work, the ILA, they're out of work, okay? Um, truckers are out of work. You've got distribution uh, center folks that are out of work. It's localized. But the way that Baltimore is set up and the way that the supply chain is now set up on the East Coast, the larger economic uh, concerns won't materialize. Uh, as a matter of fact, freight rates have dropped for containers during this period of time. One thing I will point out, and, and you had brought it up the other day, is you know there is Domino Sugar in Baltimore. And that's a huge... Um, commodity for the Mid-Atlantic. And I believe they're trucking in sugar now for the processing. That's unsustainable. So there may be a point where uh, Domino will have to idle uh, because the ships aren't coming in. You need that volume of sugar. So something may trigger on sugar economically uh, in the market. Uh, and then on the salt side, we've gone through the winter. Baltimore is a huge salt port. And that's for the road. So we have plenty of salt in the, in the Port of Baltimore. Yeah. You know, again, you know, I've watched enough economists, especially maritime ones, talk about the fact that, well, Baltimore is two, three percent of overall import. So it's not a big, huge hit. But, you know, locally, obviously, it's a huge one. I, and again, I go yeah. back to the ILA workers in the Port of Baltimore right now who aren't able to work right now. And I think that's a huge problem. Again, I, I will emphasize time and time again that these workers went to work every day during COVID. They went there and moved cargo and ensured that cargo was moving up and down the East Coast and into the interior without a problem. We're seeing the coal piers down in Norfolk at full capacity right now, but even they can't sustain that uh, level because you need the Port of Baltimore for the coal exports. So, you know, even though we're talking about getting a limited channel by the end of April, early May at the earliest, and then end of May, maybe getting the full draft of the channel, there's still going to be excavation going on. This is going to be a long term, even though it just because, you know, even if you get the channel open to the full 50 foot draft, you've got to clear the full 700 foot. You've got to get D Dally out of the way. And then you still got excavation going on. It's not like you can leave any pieces of the bridge in the navigable channel. They have to be cleared. I mean, that federal channel has got to be pure mud by the time this is done. So you're talking about getting every last piece out. And this is going to be an ongoing operation. Dredging is going to have to come in. Like you said, uh, Dally would have moved mud and it would have shifted. So we're going to talk about the excavation. And then you get into the new bridge being built and, and probably the removing of the, uh, of the pillars, uh, the old one and new ones going in. So, I mean, what we're going to see here in the short term is the opening of the limited channel, which will get us a 35 foot draft, gets the car carriers in, we'll get the cruise ships in, uh, may get some of the bulkers in, but not full size bulkers. So we may see, uh, you know, maybe become more expensive to import some stuff because you got to have to put them on shallow draft bulkers right now until you can get down to that 50 foot draft. But, you know, what is interesting to watch is the progress and it's it's been steady progress. And, and I think that's really the hallmark of what we've been seeing here is this 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 movement of car of 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 material out of the bay 
out of the channel. And most importantly, as you said, uh, where you've got groups working together, we haven't, at least we haven't seen publicly any issues uh, right. between them. Uh, you know, we've got the resources in place. Uh, the big movement is going to be when Dally moves, that's going to be a big orchestrated movement, getting that, uh, what's the major bridge off of it. Uh, but that will also clear a lot of the channel uh, and open up the channel even more. So Bill, anything you want to add uh, before we wrap yeah, up our talk say, today? Yeah, let me just, let me just throw in that the state of Maryland did step up. So you got to hand it to you know Governor Westmore and the legislature. They passed a Ports Act, and that Ports Act will take care of the local economy. So there'll be you know extra uh, payday and money um, coming in, income for the people that are affected uh, by this disaster. And they pulled together uh, the governor and the legislature to come up with this Port Act to help the citizens, to help Marylanders that are out of work. And that was a big step, and uh, they should be commended for that. And I look at that, you know, it's going to help the longshoremen, it'll help the truckers, uh, it'll help the people in and around Baltimore. Um, the mayor was involved too, Brandon Scott. So from the from the political side of, of the state and what they've done, um, it's huge. It's big. It's big for everyday people uh, and workers. So I, I, I didn't want to um, um, discount that they deserve all the credit in the world for taking care of the citizens and their people. Yeah. And, and I'll note too, that, you know, one of the things I'm noticing in ports around the United States right now is a lot more consciousness of what's going on. Uh, Norfolk has got tugs going out beyond the, the, the Bay bridge to bring ships in. San Diego has started this with the Coronado bridge. We're seeing a lot more attention being derived on this issue. And one of the things I hope is that we take measures so that this is not a short-term solution, but a long-term solution. I really think we need to take a look at ports around the United States, identify vulnerabilities and issues that are really beyond the control of the ports themselves. This is a larger issue. This is uh, DOTs on local and federal levels. Uh, this is uh, federal issues on the waterways. You know, what are we doing to do it? You know, I, I did the video on the APL Qingdo uh, coming out of Howland Hook. And, you know, what we saw was a very quick response by tugs in and around the area to grab that vessel. That ship had, had it didn't have a, a power failure. It had a propulsion issue where they lost propulsion. They didn't lose power. But the ship was coming through uh, the kills and was able to get negotiated out to the Baranzano. Uh, and then eventually was able to uh, get off the anchorage there off Stapleton and continue its voyage. These happen. And, and again, we need to be prepared for this. And, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, it, it takes a tragedy for us to really enact action to it. Uh, Bill, I want to thank you for coming on sure. again and giving us a great insight uh, and, and your perspective. And, and we really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming in and talking to me. And, and it's, it's always a pleasure to get a chance to catch up with you and find out what's going on. Anything else, Bill, before we go? No, thank you very much, Sal. All right. Well, that was Bill Doyle with us. Uh, be sure to tune in to the next episode of What's Going On With Shipping. We'll keep you up to date on what's happening with uh, all the happenings in and around the Port of Baltimore and everything to do with shipping.